the last few videos, we've been looking uh, at the yearbooks of the Porcher in High School, uh, the old yearbooks, the history of the yearbooks, a time capsule, if you may, of the yearbooks. And hopefully today we can finish that part of it up. Today, the girls at the high school are involved in all kinds of sports, but this wasn't always the case. Girl sports didn't really uh, occur until much later than the boys' sports, and I'm talking about decades later. For example, in this yearbook here that was 1978, it says girls' basketball debuts at Port Yarn. I think the title of this should be Girls' Basketball Debuts Again, because in this early photograph you can see that girls were playing basketball as early as 1909. I thought at first perhaps it was just like uh, girls basketball uh, gym class where they could play uh, against each other. But a year later in the 1910 yearbook you can see uh, they have an article alongside the photograph of the basketball team. And uh, you can see what it says here but I'll read part of it to you. Of the nine games in the schedule, five took place at the auditorium and the rest out of town. Our teams encountered Marshall, McMillan, and Flint, whose teams rank with the fastest in the state, McMillan holding this year's state championship. Though they did play other teams. In 1921, things changed for the better for the young ladies of the high school. They formed a girls' league. I won't read it at all. I'll let you read it to your leisure. I'll let you scroll down. But it starts off by saying, After many years of waiting, the girls of Port Huron High School have at last obtained their voice in school activities. In October, there was a general meeting of girls to organize a league. And it goes on to tell about it. And here's the second page. along with a couple pieces of humor at the bottom of the page. In the 1972 yearbook, we see that they had the tryouts for the first girls softball team. At least I assume it's the first. And notice they're all in their street clothes, no uniforms. And as we scan over to this next page, we can see that they're playing in their street clothes. The following year, 1973, we had the team photo and you can see still no uniforms. But in this photograph taken uh, the following year, 1974, we do see the uniforms. And we'll look at three more photographs uh, taken from uh, 1976 into 2018. In the same 1972 yearbook that we looked at the softball pitchers, we also have the volleyballers on here as well. So we know they had a volleyball team by that time as well. And as we scan over to the left, we can see a picture of that team. And this team took the EML title in 1972. By 1973, the girls had a tennis team as well as a badminton team. And you can see a couple of the tennis players playing here. Then inside the gym, you've got the badminton players. Here we have a team photo of the tennis team. And then up above here, we have the badminton team. Here's something that was kind of unexpected. Uh, the high school has a girls swimming team. I say unexpected because the high school doesn't have a pool, but it didn't stop them from having a swimming team. Good for them. Here's something I found interesting. There's a skating team. And it's composed of not only the Port Huron High School, but also the Northern High School as well. So it's a combined team effort. Even more surprising than the swimming team and the uh, skating team, I found that the high school girls have an equestrian team. I did not see that one coming. Not only did they have a team, 
they had a great team. As we zoom in and look at this title here, you can see that it says we did it again. Bringing home the title of the Michigan Interscholastical Horse Association District 12 champs two years in a row, the Big Red's equestrian team ended their season with a sense of, we did it again. And I'll let you read all of this, but it says they had 15 riders and 23 horses, and the team was split into two teams, A and B. What a commitment to be on a team like this. It's not like softball where you have to worry about buying a glove and maybe some cleats. But you've got a commitment not only to yourself, the horse, and the team. Another part of the article says this. Owning a horse is not cheap. Anywhere from $200 to $1,200 a month is spent in medical care, feed, stabling, barriers, and equipment. The financial cost is only part of the commitment. Plenty of time needs to be devoted to the training and maintaining of the animal. It takes three to four hours to prepare a horse for an equestrian meet. Training is an everyday task for horse and rider. How often? Every day. This was taken from the 2004 yearbook. And before you think, well, it's just a fluke, two years in a row, let's look at the 2005 yearbook. Three in a row, they must have done something right. All right, now I know I didn't cover all the girls' sports, nor did I cover all the boys' sports, but I did cover the ones I was interested in and I thought you might be interested in too. There is one more thing I wanted to cover. I would be remiss if I did not cover the cheerleaders that cheered all the boys and girls on in these sports. This editorial was written in the school newspaper in 1905. And it says this, Now that we have our athletic association on a firm basis, what is needed is a bleachers or rooters club. If the team of another school comes here, they should not be greeted with a crowd of spectators who are given a good imitation of an Indian war whoop. The boys, and by all means girls, should assemble and practice a few school yells and greet the visitors with some kind of spirit. It would also be a great encouragement to the team if they heard the enthusiasm break forth on regular occasions. The average person would be disconcerted by a few hundred boys and girls yelling like mad Apaches. Won't someone take the hint? And so we have the birth of the cheerleader. There are no photographs of the cheerleaders uh, until 1908, where we have this photograph here. I came across one of these cheers in uh, one of the early yearbooks. I thought it was quite unique. Smash em, mash em, hold em, hash em, tear em up and force your way. Soak em, beat em, choke em, eat em. Football is rougher than croquet. I scanned a lot of photos over the years in the yearbooks from oh, 1908 on to about 2018. I thought you might enjoy seeing these and there'll be a music accompaniment that I think you'll recognize. Yes, we've had cheerleaders for a long time. It wasn't until 1995 
that cheerleaders became part of a sports program. This is from the 1995 yearbook, and it says this, cheerleading turns competitive. Varsity cheerleading was finally added to the sports program this year. As a sport, the team is required to attend at least four competitions a year. And you can read the rest at your leisure. Another part of the article says this, despite this change, many spectators still don't consider cheerleading a sport. I think they should come to some of our practices. I think we're all proud of the Fort Huron High School cheerleaders. I know I am. All right, before we leave our little time capsule, I found a few other things uh, in one of the very old yearbooks uh, that has actually a great historical value. It's almost like a first-hand account. So I'm gonna let too much here to read uh, to you, but I'm gonna let you read it at your leisure. You can stop and uh, pause the video as you go. But uh, it's quite interesting, I think. These first couple pages uh, talk about the first schoolhouse uh, in Port Huron, uh, at least one of the two of the first uh, schoolhouses, or I guess they can't actually claim it as the first, because they really don't know the date that this was built versus the one on the north end. The article tells us the location of the building and a little bit about it, uh, and it goes uh, on from there, and we'll look at uh, each pages, and you can scroll down as you see fit. In this year book from 1911, uh, they have been occupying the new high school for only a couple of years, the new high school being what is now the uh, college. In this article, the high school 20 years ago, it's almost like a, well it is, a first-hand account or a first-person account of what it was like in that high school that you saw pictured on the opposite page uh, back when kids were going there. I really enjoy reading things like this, and I thought perhaps you might too. And this is the last page. In this article, they're talking about the new high school, which was built, uh, well, 1908. The old one burned down in 1906. And uh, they didn't have many complaints, but they did have one. And they were very upset that there wasn't a gymnasium built with the school. They hoped that it would be corrected. And the city fathers did correct it. And they bought this building, the old bowling alley, and made it into a gymnasium. And the kids, I'm sure, were quite appreciative of it, but they did have to walk a couple blocks to get there. Something else I found out by looking at one of the old yearbooks is that the area that's bordered by uh, Pine Street and uh, Union Street and the uh, military at 8th Street contain more schools than probably the rest of the city put together at one time. And here's a supporting map I found. All these squares and rectangles represent different schools in the area, along with churches too as well, because some of the uh, schools were actually in the church. Some of these squares and rectangles have uh, both letters and numbers on them, uh, more than one, which means that they could have been a school as well, but it could also have been something else was there at the time. And in this case, in that center block, you see a G and an O on a rectangle, and the O stands for the public library, which is the museum today. And the G stands for the English Lutheran Church that was there before the library, I assume. There's also an index with uh, this that tells you what everything is, and I wish there was a way I could put it all together so you wouldn't have to toggle back and forth, but I can't. Uh, if I did, you wouldn't be able to read it. It'd be so small. So you'll just have to do uh, that going back and forth. There were 12 different schools in that area, along with seven churches and a library. I also found a map of the block where the museum is today. Uh, for what it looked like in the very early days. Uh, this isn't the map. This uh, I showed you in one of the previous videos. This, uh, this area, this block, used to be called Court Square because of the courthouse being on Court Street at that time. After that, it was called the Second Ward Park. This is a map I found that I was referring to. 
This shows uh, the block where the museum is. You see Court Street at the top and of course Wall Street would be at the bottom. And that uh, kind of a half circle on the left hand corner, that was marshland. They called it a swale at that time. And uh, those little uh, things there that are labeled hay, those were flowers. The flowers were called fleur de lis, which is, I believe, a French name for a, a type of a lily. And this is what it looks like. You wouldn't think a beautiful flower like this would be growing in marshland, but it was. The flower also inspired a religious symbol. You've seen it down through the uh, early uh, ages of European uh, churches and uh, Joan of Arc carried this on her banner. And today you'll see it in the New Orleans Saints logo on their helmets and, well, everywhere else. Those stars you see on the map uh, labeled C, those are all pine trees. And uh, the building labeled G is a school we looked at earlier, the first school in that area. And the K is the old courthouse or town hall. And uh, you see Court Street there, and right in the middle of Court Street, there was a large oak tree at one time. And way down the bottom, the H was a home where they also uh, had school. Oh, and at the bottom there, where's the Z? That was a tamarack tree that was growing, well, I guess in the swamp. As we uh, saw in a previous video, along 6th Street, it was up and down. There was hills, sand, uh, hollows, and uh, the block where the museum is uh, today was called Mars Hill at one time. And uh, I found this in the yearbook. It, it gives a first-hand account of what it was like back then. So I thought it was pretty interesting. And I thought it might be kind of fun to uh, look at where these things might be today as I read that to you. You'll have to excuse my poor attempt of drawing the swamp, but it gives you an idea where it was. Port Huron's Mars Hill. Imagine yourself standing about 65 years ago on the north side of Wall Street, opposite the present location of the library, gazing at what was then called Court Square. Of course, the 65 years ago was written about 100 years ago, so it was a long time ago. This is what you would have seen. At the far side of the park, an elevated area of sand with a crescentic ridge curving from the northwest to the southeast. In the foreground at the base of the ridge was a swale dotted here and there with bunches of wild fleur de lis. Bordering the swale on the near side along Wall Street was a narrow boardwalk on stilts to keep the passerby out of the wet. Near the walk at the west border of the swale was a tamarack tree. At the east end of the walk and a little south, parallel with 6th Street, was the old Episcopal Church. The back end of it, rising, formed a six-foot stone foundation. The front end of the church, on a level, was the top of the sand ridge and resting upon it. From the vestibule of the church, a line of five or six large pine trees crowned the ridge and curved to the southwest. A large oak tree occupied a spot midway between 6th and 7th Street on what is now Court Street. Your mind's eye has now looked upon the topography of the center of the small area on and around which more schools and educational factors have been located than upon any other similar area in Port Huron. Twelve buildings on or immediately adjacent to the Second Ward Park have been used for school purposes. That tree that sit in the middle of Court Street was almost right in front of the old courthouse. That's represented by the red rectangle. Remember this school building here, what we looked at earlier, possibly the very first school building in Port Huron? Well, let me show you where it was located. It was located near the corner of 7th Street and Court Street. This building was divided into two rooms. On the east side was for the advanced classes, which was taught by a gentleman. On the west side, the other class, this was taught by a lady. This was back in about 1857. Well, this video has run a little longer than most of them, but I wanted to finish up the yearbook series and, and get on with something new. 
I hope you've enjoyed the information that you found on these last few videos. I know I have. Join me in my next video and we'll see what there is to see.